Hi everyone, this is Victor here. Welcome back to the Intelligent Research Channel. In today's video, I'm going to analyze Berkshire Hathaway stock. I will explain why I think Berkshire Hathaway is one of the best stocks for long-term investing, especially during a large market correction. More importantly, I will talk about whether Berkshire Hathaway will likely outperform the S&P 500 over the long run. If you follow the market every day, you will know that the market is still in a correction. There are many macroeconomic headwinds affecting most stocks. For example, right before making this video, Israel decided to invade Gaza after the Hamas group invaded Israel and killed over 1,000 civilians. The war in Ukraine is still ongoing. The US inflation is still well above the 2% inflation target. The US Treasury yields have increased a lot recently. This makes stocks less attractive to buy. This is because investors can buy the nearly risk-free short-term US Treasury bills that can yield over 5%. Or investors can buy the long-term US Treasuries that can yield over 4%. The long-term U.S. Treasuries risks are much lower if you hold them until maturity. The market is very concerned about the very large U.S. federal deficit. Many investors believe that the current U.S. deficit is not sustainable. The very large U.S. deficit will eventually have huge consequences affecting the U.S. economy. This is one of the biggest reasons that the long-term U.S. Treasury yields have increased a lot recently, which affects all the stocks in the U.S. and the U.S. currency. Higher U.S. Treasury yields always lead to lower stock valuations and eventually cause large market corrections. You may know this already, the S&P 500 seems to be recovering a lot and it's up by around 12% year to date this year. But this is 100% misleading because most of the gains in the S&P 500 are from the 7 largest tech companies, the Magnificent 7 stocks. For example, you can see that the Magnificent 7 stocks Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Meta, Microsoft, Nvidia, and Tesla all have very high returns this year. Without the Magnificent Seven stocks, most stocks in the S&P 500 are either flat or down year to date this year. If you don't have these Magnificent Seven stocks, your portfolio is probably still down a lot or flat this year. This is why the equally weighted S&P 500 is essentially flat this year, while the regular market cap weighted S&P 500 is up around 12% year to date this year. Going back to Berkshire Hathaway stock, Berkshire performed way well in the past one year, and it outperformed the S&P 500. One of the biggest reasons is that Berkshire has over $160 billion invested in Apple. In the past five years, Berkshire outperformed the S&P 500 by around 11%. You may notice that Berkshire Hathaway stock is less volatile than the S&P 500 index. In the past 10 years, Berkshire Hathaway outperformed the S&P 500 by a much bigger margin. It outperformed the S&P 500 by around 45% in the past 10 years. Again, Berkshire seems to be less volatile than the S&P 500 in most years. This is very important because it suggests that Berkshire has less risk than the S&P 500, especially during a market correction. So in this video, I'm going to explain why I think Berkshire Hathaway is one of the best stocks for long-term investing and explain whether it can outperform the S&P 500 over the next 10 years. You will learn about Berkshire's biggest risk to consider, Berkshire's financials, Berkshire's competitive advantage and long-term prospects, Berkshire Hathaway stock valuation, and will I buy Berkshire Hathaway stock? If you like this video, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and turn on the notification button. I will continue to make many excellent stock reviews and investing videos a week that will help you become a great investor. Each video usually takes me 20 to 30 hours to make. So if you like this channel and want to support it, check out my Patreon blog in the video description. Our goal is to help all our members grow their stock portfolios to over 7 figures over time. Once you become a Patreon member, you can follow all the stocks I'm investing in for the long term and download the latest intrinsic value calculators for all the stocks I'm analyzing. So you will know when a stock becomes undervalued, fairly valued, or overvalued now. Also, you have access to all my latest stock ratings for all the stocks I'm analyzing. The link is in the video description. Take a look, let's start. Before talking about Berkshire's long-term prospects, I want to share with you Berkshire's biggest risk to consider and Berkshire's financials first. Warren Buffett has made Berkshire Hathaway the most successful investment holding company in the world since he took over the company in 1965. Buffett also has the longest track record in beating the S&P 500 since 1965. So from 1965 to 2022, Berkshire Hathaway has had a compounded annual gain of 19.8%. 
This is two times the S&P 500's compound annual gain during the same period. In terms of overall gain, if you invested in Berkshire in 1964 and held Berkshire until 2022, your overall gain would be almost 3.8 million percent. Just to compare, if you invested in the S&P 500 during the same period, your overall gain would be much less at around 24.7 thousand percent. This is still not bad at all. This shows the power of compounding if you invest in great companies at the right price over the long term. I think Berkshire's first biggest risk is management change when Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are no longer with us. At the time of making this video, Warren Buffett is already 93 years old and Charlie Munger is already 99 years old. When it comes to investing, I don't think Warren Buffett's successor Greg Abel will be able to copy Warren Buffett and achieve the same success as him. I don't think anyone can replace Warren Buffett when it comes to investing. Based on what I know, Warren Buffett is choosing Greg Abel as his successor because he believes that Greg Abel will keep the same culture in Berkshire. According to CNBC, Abel is also known for his strong expertise in the energy industry. Berkshire acquired Mid American Energy in 1999 and Abel became CEO of the company in 2008, six years before it was renamed Berkshire Hathaway Energy in 2014. Greg Abel has been with Berkshire for more than 20 years. He has been the vice chairman of Berkshire, running all the non-insurance businesses since 2018. Another thing we should consider is whether Greg Abel will have the same interest as Berkshire's shareholders. Warren Buffett has almost 100% of his net worth invested in Berkshire. According to the CNBC, Greg Abel has around 105 million of his net worth invested in Berkshire. I don't know how much net worth Greg Abel has, but having 105 million of his net worth in Berkshire suggests that he will likely have the same interest and business owner mindset as Berkshire's shareholders. I think the important thing we do not know is whether Greg Abel will be a very good asset manager like Warren Buffett. Once Greg Abel succeeds Warren Buffett as Berkshire's CEO, he will need to invest Berkshire's large amount of capital to buy elephant-sized businesses, so Berkshire can grow much more going forward. Berkshire's revenue growth has slowed down a lot in recent years. Berkshire will need to buy out more elephant-sized businesses going forward. Greg Abel will also need to manage Berkshire's risk and hire the right managers to run each business. Talkcoms and Ted Wessler are already managing about 10% of Berkshire's 300 billion plus stock portfolio. They will likely take over Warren Buffett's investment role and manage Berkshire's entire 300 billion plus investments going forward. So only time will tell whether Greg Abel will be the right fit to run Berkshire going forward. Hopefully, he will be as good as Tim Cook who took over Apple after Steve Jobs passed away. Here's another risk we should consider. Berkshire is well diversified in many industries. Berkshire has over 65 companies and over 200 subsidiaries in many industries. Berkshire's business range from insurance companies to energy, utilities, railway, retail, and manufacturing and services. It's almost impossible to understand all of Berkshire's companies. Berkshire does not reveal all the company's financials to investors because it will give away too much info to competitors. When you're investing in Berkshire, you're essentially relying on Buffett and his future successors to do the right things, hire the right managers, and invest in the right businesses that have good long-term prospects while managing risk well. Here, you can see that Berkshire groups all its businesses into these operating businesses. Insurance Business Group, which includes Geico, Berkshire Hathaway Primary Group, and Berkshire Hathaway Reinsurance Group, BNSF Railway, which is one of the largest railway companies in the US, Berkshire Hathaway Energy, Pilot Travel Centers, Manufacturing, McLean, Service and Retailing. Berkshire is much more transparent about its insurance businesses, BNS Railway, and Berkshire Hathaway Energy business. But Berkshire is not transparent about its manufacturing, service, and retail businesses. There are just too many companies under Berkshire, so it's not possible for Berkshire to review each company's financials. And Berkshire doesn't want to do that very likely because of competitive reasons. If you look at the most recent financials here, you will notice that Berkshire's insurance business, BNSF, Berkshire Hathaway Energy, manufacturing, and service and retailing businesses tend to make the most operating income every quarter. For example, in the most recent quarter here, Berkshire's insurance business, which includes both underwriting profit and investment income, contributed nearly 40% of Berkshire's total operating income. BNSF contributed about 14%. Berkshire Hathaway Energy contributed about 5%. Manufacturing contributed about 27%, and service and retailing contributed about 11% of Berkshire's operating income. 
I want to talk more about Berkshire's insurance business here, so you will know Berkshire's biggest risk going forward. Berkshire's most important business is its insurance business, which includes Geico, Berkshire Hathaway Primary Group, and Berkshire Hathaway Reinsurance Group. The insurance industry is very competitive. Insurance products are commodities. They are generally the same. Insurance companies have to compete based on pricing and based on how much risk they are willing to take on each insurance policy. Typically, if an insurance company wants to win a business and gain more market share, the insurance company will have to offer the lowest price possible. Otherwise, the client can buy the same insurance policy at a lower price from another insurance company. The biggest risk is this. If the insurance company's insurance premium is too low, and if the premium is not enough to cover both insurance claims and underwriting expenses every quarter, the insurance company will have large underwriting losses. This is what happened to Geico in 2022 here. Geico had an underwriting loss in 2022 because the premium was not enough to cover all the insurance claims and expenses. Now, Geico has recovered a lot and is earning an underwriting profit again. This is because Geico recently increased its premium and cut down many expenses. Here's another insurance risk we should consider. Historically, Berkshire had underwriting profits almost every year in the past 40 years. But if there are large catastrophes such as hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, cyber attacks, or even terrorist attacks in the US, Berkshire will likely have very large underwriting losses in the future. It is impossible to predict when these large catastrophes will happen. This is why Berkshire has to keep at least $30 billion in cash every quarter in case these catastrophic events happen. According to the most recent earnings report here, Berkshire's unpaid loss estimates were approximately $143 billion as of June 30th, 2023. If you look at the financials here, you can see that Berkshire has around $174 billion of unpaid losses and insurance claims that will need to be paid out later on. These are insurance claims and liabilities that are not paid out yet. Also, Berkshire has around $125 billion of debt. In total, Berkshire has around $300 billion of unpaid losses, insurance claims, debt, and other borrowings. Just to compare, at the time of making this video, Berkshire has around $147 billion of cash equivalents, $20 billion of fixed income securities, and $350 billion of equity investments. In total, Berkshire has around $523 billion of cash, short-term U.S. Treasury bills, fixed income securities, and stocks. This is more than enough to cover all of Berkshire's debt, unpaid losses, and other insurance liabilities. This suggests that Berkshire has a very strong balance sheet. Buffett stated that Berkshire will always keep at least $30 billion of cash and equivalents. This is to make sure Berkshire will always have enough cash in case there are large catastrophic events. I want to talk about Berkshire's long-term prospects here, so you will know whether Berkshire can outperform the S&P 500 over the next 5-10 to 10 years. In the past 10 years, you can see that Berkshire had very consistent revenue growth, fairly stable free cash flow growth, and very consistent book value per share growth. Berkshire's book value per share is a very good indicator of Berkshire's intrinsic value per share growth. Generally speaking, as long as Berkshire's book value per share is growing, Berkshire's intrinsic value per share is also growing. Berkshire's book value per share has been growing faster than the company's revenue growth very likely because Berkshire has been buying back more shares almost every year. Also, Berkshire's $300 billion plus stock portfolio has grown a lot in the past 10 years, which increases Berkshire's interest value per share as well as book value per share. As long as Berkshire's total revenue, operating income, free cash flow, and book value per share are growing, Berkshire's interest value per share will also grow gradually over time. Buffett wrote this in the most recent annual shareholder letter. He explained that the American tailwind is the most important factor that drives Berkshire's long-term growth. This will still be the case going forward. He said, thus began our journey to 2023, a bumpy road involving a compilation of continuous savings by our owners, that is by their retained earnings, the power of compounding, our avoidance of major mistakes, and most important of all, the American tailwind. America would have done fine without Berkshire. The reverse is not true. In my opinion, I think there are two major factors that will drive Berkshire's long-term growth over the next 5 to 10 years. The first factor is Berkshire's insurance business, and the second factor is America's long-term economic tailwind. Let me explain these two factors here. This is from Morningstar. Morningstar gave Berkshire a wide economic modes rating. This analyst did a great job explaining Berkshire's economic modes, Berkshire's insurance business, and how it works. 
We have historically believed that Berkshire's economic moat is more than just a sum of its parts, although the parts that make up the whole are fairly multi in their own regard. The insurance operations Geico, Berkshire Hathaway Reinsurance Group, and Berkshire Hathaway Primary Group remain important contributors to the overall business. Not only are they expected to account for around 30% of Berkshire's pre-tax earnings and 50% of our valuation of the firm, but they are overcapitalized. Maintaining a larger than normal equity investment portfolio for a property and casualty insurer, and generally low cost float. These temporary cash holdings, which arise from premiums being collected in advance of future claims, have allowed Berkshire to generate additional returns as the company invests these funds in assets that are commensurate with the duration of business being underwritten. And they have tended to come at little to no cost to Berkshire, given the company's proclivity for generating underwriting gains the past several decades. I believe Berkshire has these two biggest competitive advantages that are closely related, insurance floats and the very strong balance sheet I showed you earlier. It's very hard for competitors to copy Berkshire's large amount of insurance floats and very strong balance sheet. Berkshire has one of the largest insurance floats in the US. When Berkshire bought national indemnity and went into the insurance business in 1967, Berkshire only had 16 million of insurance floats. At the time of making this video, Berkshire's insurance float has grown to 166 billion. Warren Buffett expects that Berkshire's insurance float will continue to grow steadily over time. Berkshire's insurance businesses will continue to underwrite more insurance policies over time. Historically, Berkshire had underwriting profits almost every year in the past 40 years. This is not usual at all. This means Berkshire is being paid to hold a large amount of premium every year, does not pay out yet. This is known as an insurance float. Berkshire can invest the premium does not pay out yet for Berkshire's benefits. Berkshire can invest these insurance floats in stocks, bonds, US treasuries, and other fixed income securities in order to make more investment income. Based on what I know, most insurance companies tend to have more underwriting losses over the years because they want to capture more market shares by offering lower premiums to clients. As long as there are no major catastrophes such as hurricanes, earthquakes, and floods in the US, I believe Berkshire will continue to have underwriting profits in most years going forward. Here's another competitive advantage. Every year, Berkshire can earn higher investment income by investing these insurance floats in stocks, bonds, US treasuries, and even buying out other companies. Most companies cannot copy Berkshire's investments. Most insurance companies have to invest most of their insurance floats in fixed income securities and US treasuries that had much lower yields before. Berkshire is much more flexible than most insurance companies. Berkshire can use its insurance float and the free cash flow from other non-insurance businesses to invest in stocks, bonds, short-term US treasuries, and even buying out other companies such as Allegheny Corporation. In the past 5 years, Berkshire had an average of $24 billion of free cash flow each year. I believe Berkshire's free cash flow will grow over time because most of Berkshire's businesses such as insurance, railway, utilities, energy, manufacturing, and retail businesses are largely tied to the U.S. economy. As long as the U.S. economy is strong and it's growing over time, most of Berkshire's businesses will also grow over time. This is why Buffett said that Berkshire benefits the most from the American tailwind. Without the American tailwind or America's economic engine, Berkshire would not perform as well as today. Because Berkshire generates so much free cash flow each year, well over $20 billion of free cash flow each year, Buffett and his future successors will need to acquire more elephant-sized businesses in order to grow Berkshire much more over the next 10 years. At the time of making this video, Berkshire has around $147 billion of cash on hand. Berkshire will always keep at least $30 billion in cash in case there are major catastrophes or there's a large recession. This means Berkshire has around $117 billion in dry powder to buy out other elephant-sized businesses. Right now, the short-term U.S. Treasury bills have very high yields that are above 5%. Berkshire has over $97 billion in U.S. Treasury bills. This means Berkshire is earning high interest income from U.S. Treasury bills yielding over 5% with little to no risk at all. You may be interested in Buffett's $300 billion plus stock portfolio here. You may not know this, Buffett's $300 billion plus stock portfolio is leveraged. This is because a large amount of this capital is from the insurance float Berkshire earns every year. This is why Warren Buffett cannot take too much risk when he invests in stocks. He likes to invest in dividend-paying stocks that are well-managed. 
He likes to invest in companies that have large economic moats, capable and trustworthy management teams, high return on investment capital, and great long-term prospects. He likes to buy stocks when they're undervalued. He said this, Our goal in both forms of ownership is to make meaningful investments in businesses with both long-lasting, favorable economic characteristics and trustworthy managers. Please note, particularly, that we own publicly traded stocks based on our expectations about their long-term business performance, not because we view them as vehicles for adroit purchases and sales. That point is crucial. Charlie and I are not stock pickers. We are business pickers. All things considered, I believe this portfolio will grow substantially over time. This because Buffett and his future successors will continue to invest birth shots insurance folks in dividend-paying stocks that will be tied to the U.S. economy. As long as the U.S. economy and the S&P function are growing over time, this portfolio will also grow a lot over time. This will increase Berkshire's interest value per share and book value per share. Berkshire has other major businesses such as BNS Railway, Berkshire Hathaway Energy, and a large group of manufacturing, service, and retailing businesses. I said this earlier, I don't think it's possible to look at each company individually because there are too many companies under Berkshire. Also, Berkshire does not review all the company's financials, so we can only look at these businesses as a group. If you look at these companies as a group, you will notice that they are largely tied to the U.S. economy. When the U.S. economy is doing well, most of Berkshire's businesses such as railway, energy, utilities, manufacturing, surface and retail businesses will also do well. And when the U.S. economy is not doing well, most of these businesses will have much lower revenue growth or even negative earnings growth. For example, BNSF Railway's operating income decreased a lot compared to last year because of a lower shipment volume of industrial products compared to last year. I think this suggests that the U.S. economy has slowed down compared to last year. Over the long term, as long as interest rates are not too high and the U.S. economy is growing, I believe most of Berkshire's businesses will also grow over time. Most of these businesses are very mature, so most of them have very low growth rates. Realistically, I think most of these businesses such as insurance, BNS Railway, Berkshire Hathaway Energy, manufacturing, surface and retailing should grow by about 4% to 6% annually over the next 5 to 10 years. Here's a comparison. Historically, in the past 5 years and 10 years, Berkshire's total revenue grew at a compound annual growth rate CAGR of 6.8%. Berkshire is much bigger than 10 years ago. I think it's reasonable to expect that Berkshire's revenue will grow at a CAGR of between 4% and 6% over the next 5 years. I'm assuming Berkshire will not have very large acquisitions over the next 5 years. Wall Street analysts also expect that Berkshire's revenue will grow at around 4% to 6% each year over the next 3 years. Again, this is assuming that Berkshire will not have any large elephant-sized business acquisitions over the next 3 years. I want to show you how to calculate Berkshire Hathaway stocks in just right here, so you will know when Berkshire becomes undervalued, fairly value, or overvalued. If you want this calculator, you can download it from my Patreon blog. The link is in the video description. These are the key assumptions in this calculator. I'm not using a sum of the parts valuation model here to calculate Berkshire's interest value. Instead, I'm using a DCF model to calculate Berkshire's interest value per share. This because Berkshire already has very consistent free cash flow growth and has many very mature and stable businesses. I define Berkshire's interest value as its future free cash flows discounted to the present day. I use the discount rate of 10% here. You can use a higher discount rate here if you want to be more conservative. Based on the long-term prospects I talked about earlier, I believe Berkshire's revenue will grow at a compound annual growth rate CAGR between 4% and 6% over the next 5 years. This assuming Berkshire will not have any large acquisitions over the next 5 years. Of course, if Berkshire buys elephant-sized businesses, Berkshire's revenue growth will be slightly higher. Let's go over these three case scenarios here, worst case, normal case, and best case scenarios. Under the worst case scenario, we're forecasting that Berkshire's revenue will grow at a CAGR of 4% over the next 5 years. If we forecast Berkshire's free cash flow over the next 5 years and discount the free cash flow to the present day, Berkshire's intrinsic value should be around $820 billion for the entire company or $377 per share. I'm giving this scenario a 25% probability here. Under the base case scenario, we're forecasting that Berkshire's revenue will grow at a CAGR of 5% over the next 5 years. Then Berkshire's intrinsic value should be around $847 billion for the entire company or $390 per share. I'm giving this scenario a 50% probability here. 
under the best case scenario, we're forecasting that Berkshire's revenue will grow at a category of 6% over the next five years. Then Berkshire's intrinsic value should be around $875 billion for the entire company, or $402 per share. I'm giving this scenario a 25% probability here. If you add all these numbers here, Berkshire's intrinsic value should be around $390 per share. I also used a forward price to sales valuation model here to estimate Berkshire's intrinsic value, which should be around $707 billion for the entire company, or around $325 per share. If we take the average of both valuation models here, I believe Berkshire's intrinsic value should be around $357 per share. Just to compare, Morningstar gave Berkshire a much higher fair value of $400 per share. This means I believe Berkshire is slightly undervalued at the time of making this video. So, will I buy Berkshire Hathaway stock? Yes, I would likely buy back Berkshire Hathaway shares if Berkshire Hathaway dips below my interest value. This is my own prediction. I think Berkshire will have a bigger chance of matching the S&P financials performance over the next 10 years than beating it. Berkshire is much bigger than 10 years ago. Berkshire's businesses are very mature and have very low growth rates, so it will be hard for Berkshire to beat the S&P function over the next 10 years. Unless Berkshire buys more elephant-sized businesses, which will increase Berkshire's revenue growth and operating income growth. During a market downturn, I believe Berkshire tends to have less risk and volatility than the S&P function. This is because Berkshire is well diversified in many industries and has many very mature businesses such as insurance, railway, utilities, and energy. The downside is that most of Berkshire's businesses have very low growth rates. This is one of my personal growth stock portfolios. I also have other portfolios with almost the same stocks and the same investing strategy. I don't have Berkshire Hathaway stock in this portfolio now. Personally, I prefer much higher growth companies such as Visa, Mastercard, American Express, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Nvidia, and Meta. This portfolio has been doing very well even in this market. I think the biggest reason is that I have invested in most of the beneficent selling stocks such as Apple, Google, and Microsoft when they were more undervalued before. Right now, the market is still in a correction because of all the macroeconomic headwinds. I'm planning to take advantage of this market by adding more to many of these stocks here because some of them have become undervalued. My strategy is to invest in the best companies that are undervalued. I define the best companies as businesses that are well managed, with large economic modes, great products and services, great long-term prospects, increasing earnings, and increasing free cash flows over time. Similar to Buffett, I like to be greedy when others are fearful, so I like to invest only when the stock is traded below its intrinsic business value. This strategy has worked very well for me, even in this market. Now, all these are only my opinions and my analysis based on my research. They are not financial advice. There are always risks associated with investing. You will need to do your own research and do your extra due diligence first before investing in anything. Thank you for watching this video and supporting our channel. This is Victor from the Intelligent Research Channel, and I will see you in the next video.